in our community. Uh, I'll explain it as best I can. Um, in 2005, <laughs> this over here, this is Della's William Carlos Williams Symposium. And then, oh, I need two hands for this. <laughs> and then this over here is John Trouss's idea for a poetry reading <laughs> series. Uh, Jane Fisher. Uh, Jane Fisher. She's, she's not here yet. They got together. And, and the Williams, our community was conceived in late 2005. In 2006, it was born. The community was born. Jane Fisher was the midwife. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do that thing again, yeah. This is a this is a no, no, before that. Fifteen seconds before that. I don't remember fifteen seconds ago. All right. So, but here's the thing. It was Jim Klein who baptized the baby. Oh. With a poetry workshop. And then christened it in 2008 with the Red Wheelbarrow magazine slash anthology. So this community would not exist as it is now without Jim Klein. Uh, but, uh, but there's more to Jim than us. Uh, he, he's the author of six or so poetry books. His poems have been published in a hundred or so literary magazines. Back in the 70s, he started Fairleigh Dickinson's poetry journal called Lunch, in spite of the fact, and probably because of the fact, that Fairleigh Dickinson already had a poetry journal. <laughs> he was also an associate professor at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And where was this Fairleigh Dickinson? <laughs> Look around you. He has a uh, he has a poem called 220 Montrose. Um, and we're 223, I think. 233. 233. Um, in the past I've tried to analyze Jim's poetry, which is a quixotic and Herculean task. I will not be attempting that tonight. You'll hear enough of it to get your own idea. I will also not talk about his bipolar disorder and the very interesting consequences it had for his life. I would rather spend the rest of my introduction talking about Jim as a teacher and a mentor. Even though the workshop was definitely his workshop and he had the last word, he did not present himself as an authority on poetry. In fact, he was uh, quick to say that he turned to poetry precisely because he didn't know anything about it. And he wanted to create with that freedom of not knowing what he was doing. A lot of his poems are about that freedom, but I'm not going to talk about his poems. If you went into his workshop as a beginner, he would help you find a way to write your poems. But if you went into his workshop thinking you already knew how to write poems, <laughs> then you were like someone who just got your driver's license, got an A on the written exam. But Jim was not the driving instructor, nor was he the police officer. Jim was a deer in the road. <laughs> he wouldn't claim to know more about poetry than you or compete with you. He would simply challenge you. Maybe sometimes he'd give you poem of the week, but more often than not, he would find something in your poem that just wasn't right. Arthur has called me his bullshit meter, but Jim was the original bullshit meter. He would press you on your poem. He would haunt you. <laughs> and if you're too in your head, like I am, he would encourage you to get out of it. His influence on my poetry is huge. I don't even know the full dimensions of it. <laughs> Talking about Jim Klein. <laughs> so I present you it's the best moment so, <laughs> so tonight, 
Um, I present, I'm introducing an artist who not only has his own body of work, but who helped many of us create our bodies of work. Here, here. Someone who has made a qualitative difference to the universe. Mm -hmm. Jim Klein. Wow. Oh. Now, Jim, with his tendency for curveballs, uh, is not coming up right away. We're going to have people read Jim's poems and, or say, and say a few words about Jim if they're so moved. Uh, and I'll be calling them up. The first one I would like to come up is Mark Fogarty. Yeah! Uh, Thank you, Don. Thank you, Jim. Uh, the first time that I ever saw Jim Klein was about 40 years ago. Uh, across the street from here, it was called Fairleigh Dickinson University back then, and he was having one of his wild-ass poetry readings in the cafeteria over there. I was a beginning poet. I was too shy to introduce myself to him, but I saw him. He was kind of, you know, flapping around uh, from here to there and uh, marshalling and uh, arguing and uh, making it all work. And I was totally impressed by this poetry reading because everybody was drunk. It went on until midnight. I guess the janitor had been tipped off or paid off or something. And the poets were all yelling and, you know, making fun of each other. So when I was walking home after that, I said to myself, well, if this is what being the poet is about, I'm all in. So <laughs> we started something that night. I actually met him uh, for the first time in 2007 at one of the readings at the Williams Center. And he invited me to come to the workshop, which I did and got a lot out of. Uh, there were basically two grades you could get from Jim on a poem, and I've gotten both of them. One is, that's really good, and the other is, that really sucks. <laughs> so probably many of you have got that same, that same report card. Um, but anyway, uh, he invited me to come to the workshop, and I did. I think it was in February of 2008. And uh, he wasn't there. And it turns out that he was, uh, he and Zarita were in uh, Trinidad for a couple of weeks. So uh, as it turns out, that trip inspired the poem of his that I want to read tonight, which is called The Goat. And it's in a great uh, collection of gems. Actually, I think it's his first book called Blue Chevys. And uh, if you haven't got this one, I definitely invite you to go on, on the internet and, and pick it up. Internet's right over there. The internet, right over here by Don. <laughs> well, Mark, you say that you're the first, my first publisher. I was Jim's first publisher, and uh, I just got him to sign the book tonight after 10 years of publishing it. So <laughs> it's a tough guy. We, yeah, he's a tough guy to get. So uh, Anyway, I'm going to read The Goat, and uh, mine is uh, one line, but I can tell you what the line is later if you like. This is called The Goat, El Dorado Village, Trinidad. I don't want to kill the animal. I don't want to kill the goat. I don't want to bring the machete of subject and predicates down on Bobby's wedding for his daughter. By hacksaw, cleaver, and knife, I don't want to render the body and spirit of Boyo into edible bits, no matter how delicious. I want the goat whole. There's nothing to prove to the goat as Shafina and her sister watch in black hajibs from the house. He doesn't need to be led by a rope and relieved of his life in a little spurting fountain or trussed up by a hind leg in the face of his own cage beneath the flimsy galvanized in service to what blank red Vatican he knows not, the poem. Bobby hangs his hat where he can't reach. 40 pounds of garlic, 200 of flour for roti, part of palms stacked like whale bones, and, I'm ashamed to say, boxes of cubed frozen goat. But Bobby has to sell his truck because sugarcane is a weed in Trinidad now. Before that, his top shelf restaurant failed, and he has a prior. 10 years in the slammer in Barbados for smuggling drugs. My wife estimates his marriage, marriages, at four. Light rain drums on the roof, 
and I watch from the dung jeweled pen. Bobby has more charisma than any man deserves. He loiters in across his muddy dump, roped this last time to his goat. It doesn't take a genius to see something mythic is happening. But like the man being ridden out of town on a rail, if it wasn't for the honor, I'd just as soon walk. There was talk that someone knew the short version and someone else the long, but the truth is that no word, no words as words at all were spoken. Of course, Bobby's just trying to be a good Muslim. The rest are Pentecostal. And maybe killing his good friend will take his mind off his daughter's wedding. Bobby tips the goat like a dining room table and the white hair white capped old factotum dispatches voiceless boyo fairly routinely. We hoisted the flapping sacrifice like an engine in a garage, cleaving the hide whitish inside, drawing and quartering as they say, the phosphorescent guts ballooning onto the white plastic pail. At Bobby's order, I retrieved the muddy skin from beneath the swinging goat. I divided the coat on the side of the pen and gave it a little pet. Just then, a little black boy showed up and began an interrogation. In the car on the way home from Second Sunday, Halima says, Jim dance chutney, Jim cut up goat, Jim plenty plenty. Stag is a man's beer. Guinness is good for you. Be free of yourself. Chant and be happy. To be born and to live every day is to kill plenty plenty. Thank you, Jim. John Borale here with us. It's been a long time and you are sorely missed, John. Um, I know you don't want to read a poem, but you did say you had a few words to say about Jim, so I'd like you to come up. Can't read. Not even. Yeah. I don't want to. He's lost two right. Right. Years ago. Well, good evening, everyone. Man, this is like a reunion of Caesar's 10th Legion, all these toilets. <laughs> so many battles we fought together. Well, folks, it looks like we did cross the Rubicon. <laughs> uh, quite a few years ago in Life Magazine, I read an article about Robert Frost, and it stuck to me. Uh, the, the journalist was, must have been some snotty-nosed, you know, simpering new, new bird who asked Frost, tell me, what do you think about life? What can you describe it? Well, Frost, without miss, missing a beat, said three words. It goes on. <laughs> and that's very true about life. We are all here today because of one man whose legacy goes on and will be around for many, and many a year. Nobody here didn't learn how to write poetry from Jim. I wouldn't have been able to write a decent word unless it was for Jim. I always get around and call him my sensei, but it is the truth. He really is my sensei. He is my teacher. And we've locked horns, like any student teacher. You know, the little student gets a little uh, uppity. <laughs> and Jim would quite correctly smack me down. But in those smackdowns, I learned an awful lot. Thank you, Jim, for all your tremendous years of service. This is truly your legacy. It will go on for 40, 50, 60 years. As long as poetry is mentioned in Rutherford, your name is there. Let's hear it from you. Uh, next, I would like Della to come up. Oh. Della Rowley. I'm supposed to stand. <laughs> uh, stand wherever you want. No, I'll move this thing okay. to where you want to be. Well, um, I was going to talk about the symposium, and I uh, covered that. And I was going to talk about. Did I really cover it? <laughs> 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 you did, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, because that's the first time I met Jim. Was right after the symposium, um, and 
which was a really smashing success. And because of that, then Jane Fisher and John wanted to start the uh, collaborative. And there was a meeting, I forget where, but one of the people there was Jim. And as everyone was talking and carrying on, Jim was sort of sitting over um, in one place just muttering about, <laughs> I already, I've already done lunch. I already did lunch. I thought, who is that asshole? <laughs> <laughs> who is that curmudgeon over there? <laughs> well, I found out. I found out about lunch, which I didn't know anything about, and I also <laughs> got to know uh, Jim. Um, and I'm gonna share one little story about uh, him during one of the readings. Um, he uh, came up to me and said, I want you to meet my wife. And I said, okay. And um, then he, he muttered again. <laughs> this is the way Jim talks in little ellipses. Um, he's something about um, when I met her, I gave her flowers. And I said, okay. Uh, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but all I know is that when Zarita was walking toward us, Jim's face was beaming so intensely mm -hmm. that I was almost embarrassed by the frankness of his, the love for her that he was showing me. So mm -hmm. that was another, the second encounter that I remember. Um, then the workshops came, and I think all of us have learned something from Jim, if not one thing, many things, and it is poetry. Um, we had Poem of the Week, which was always great to get. Um, Jim was always famous for lopping off either the top <laughs> part of your poem or the bottom part. You know, it's like, start the second stanza. That, you know, it's like, but, but I worked so hard on that one that it, it's just an intro, you don't need it. And he was always right. Um, so personally, my, my poetry has improved greatly because of Jim and his lopping and his <laughs> elliptical speech. Um, and what generosity to spend so much time in a workshop, running a workshop. <clears throat> generosity of time. Um, I have a, um, I share a sensibility with Jim that's meaningful to me, and that is that we both grew up in the Midwest. Um, I grew up in Indiana, he grew up in North Dakota, and uh, spent some time in Franklin, Indiana, which is about two hours drive north of Evansville, where I grew up. And Evansville's in the very, very southwest corner of Indiana, right across the river from uh, Kentucky. And southern Indiana is farmer's place. Um, it's farm country. It's, there's vastness there that's not here. There's acres of crops as far as the eye can see. There are big skies, there are silos that raise up out of the field like the Twin Towers. Um, there's dirt and there's animals. And um, I think also um, there's a clipped manner of speaking that farmers have and people in South, in Indiana and the Midwest, I think. And I think that's informed Jim's poetry. That's, that's my opinion. Um, and I think his people um, show an economy of words and that has affected the economy of his poems and the people uh, in his life come out in his poems. It gives him life, even when the poem is not about him. And sometimes he's still an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a curmudgeon of the best kind. I'm going to read a couple of the poems. This one is called Repose. Despite your repose, feet on a bar stool, half your hands and arms on the bar in an attitude of repose, something expansive and heightened, almost like a bit of high culture, comes bluely into this dark bar by a little old man with an empty pack of cigarettes and suddenly you see across the canyon, like a screen. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 And this one uh, is called To the Reader, and this is for all of us. <laughs> to the Reader. I wish for us both on a friendlier night, 
a tissue of verbs softly and rhythmically pulling us out to sea mm -hmm. where we can get everything just so and really start working on our co-authorship mm -hmm. until our mutual blind drunkenness has been achieved and we have used each other as indiscriminately and tastefully as possible. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing left but to call it quits, hopelessly addicted and happily sated. <laughs> Thank you. And now batting cleanup, John J. Trout. This is really a wonderful privilege. I'm so glad that we've. Uh, that the Gang of Five has, uh, have decided, has decided to, um, to feature Jim and also to create this tribute. Um, I have a couple of things to say about Jim. I met Jim in 1982 at the um, dedication of the Williams Center um, on one Williams Way right off Park Avenue. And I didn't know who he was. He was reading. He was one of the, the invited readers. And I remember there was this guy with long, greasy hair in the audience heckling Jim and calling out. And just, like, I, didn't, I had no idea who this was. Later on, I found out that it was Peter Orlovsky, you know, the famous <laughs> beat. And I went up to Jim and I said, who? I didn't know, you know, I just introduced myself. I was in college at the time, and I said, who was that guy? Like, what was going on there? Like, did that bother you? And he's like, ah, oh, no, that's all part of the game. <laughs> and that taught me to this day, and I did it tonight, that it's essential in certain ways that when someone's speaking, when someone's sharing, it's not inappropriate to, in a, <clears throat> not to heckle necessarily, but to engage the person from the audience, and I love that. I just love Jim's, the way he received that and you know, gave his assent to it. That's unfortunate, John. <laughs> <laughs> the, second, the second thing I like to say, Jim invited me as this young poet who was so imbued with the romantic tradition that I used to write like John. People would say, oh, that's so, oh, that sounds like John Keats, that's so good. So Jim invited me to his class. He was teaching an evening poetry class at that round building right here on Montrose Avenue on the campus. And I remember going in there and I saw that Jim was furiously ripping apart his real students. I was just auditing it for that, that class for the night. I wasn't associated with uh, Fairley Dickinson University, but he invited me, he was very generous. And I remember he was like tearing people's poems apart. So afterwards, he had seen my work. I had um, shared it in the beginning of the class with the other students. And he, he said, your work is perfect. It's very good. There's nothing I could do with it. And I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, but you have to find your own voice. This is somebody else's voice. And that is the great lesson that Jim taught me, that I had to find my own voice. And over time, of course, I have many voices in my poetry and in my performance. So I really have to say Jim made me the poet that I am today and the writer that I am today. Um, and I'm eternally grateful. What many people don't know, mm. or some do, is that Jim is also an accomplished painter. Mm. And when... I stepped down as one of the um, organizers of the Red, what is now called the Red Wheelbarrow in December of 2012. John Varali stepped up and wanted to take over for me. Jane was sort of moving out. She had moved, I think, to Connecticut by that point, Jane Fisher, the, direct, the former director of the Rutherford Public Library. So I was kind of solo. John Varali stepped up and said, I want to, I want to, um, do this, but I want to. I don't want a committee. Jim appointed a committee, <laughs> which is now the Gang of Six, and they broke one of the rules that I had established with Jane Fisher: do not repeat your features, because I had seen so many reading series 
where they repeat the features and it kind of peters out. It's no longer exciting. They broke that rule. They gave me a feature in January of 2013. They had a party back at Jim and Zarita's house for me. And then Jim said, I want to thank you for doing this. Um, I'd like to offer one of my paintings to you. You could choose whichever you want. And I saw that he had painted this black, all black canvas that was very textured with the, with the paint. And on this painting, he stuck two paintbrushes, one thick paintbrush that you would use to paint, um, you know, the trim on a, a door or a window or even the wall, and then a smaller one. And I'm like, oh wow, that's like Jim Dine, the artist who would actually incorporate into his work tools and that sort of thing. And I'm thinking, Jim Dine, Jim Klein, this is, I love this piece, this is the one I want. And Jim said, I was thinking about you when I painted this. <laughs> so it was very appropriate that I chose that. So I would like, the poem that I would like to read is in the most recent Red Wheelbarrow, which is number 16 from 2023. His poem. It's a great one. It is. Just paint the damn thing black. Yep. And I'm wondering, is, was that uh -huh. about painting that painting? I don't know. <laughs> Just paint the damn thing black. Just paint the damn thing black and the next day take sharp objects in both hands and scratch away to the dramatic music which happens to be waiting on the machine until it tells you to stop. And lo and behold, You've got a painting. The gestures left by your competing hands make a complementary tangle of the underlying yellows and reds and lesser auxiliary marks and compose a beautiful concussion on the black negative space above the drowned undergarment beneath. You've made this stark painting but haven't a clue how to make the next one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Jim Klein. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Next, I'd like to bring up someone who's known Jim almost as long as John J. Trouss, Zarita Muhammad. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Jim wrote um, telling his father about me. His father is long gone. And <clears throat> I'd like to tell you about my wife. Third time's the charm. Mm -hmm. She's an East Indian from Trinidad. She lived in a mud house and carried water on her carried water with her sister, so she has a perfectly flat head. <laughs> when they got running water, they rubbed their bottoms on the village standpipe. I guess she was about 10 or 11. She and her sister had to chop firewood in the morning by torchlight and get cow shit for the floors. She was beaten by her mother. Once her father made her hold a, hold a big rock over her head as punishment until her neighbor rescued her. Another neighbor who she wished was her mother got her head cut off with a cutlass. She saw that and her father tried to put the head back and gave the woman sips of salt water. She was bookish and unhappy despite excelling in cricket, she said. She came to America as a mother's helper in her teens to a Westchester family. So she is an unusual combo of peasant and aristocrat. She finished high school and worked her way through a master's degree in social work with an assortment of jobs, the last being a chef for eight years for an ambassador he never declared her for social security. So we're still paying for that. 
He has an endowed chair in history at Princeton. She is a better flower arranger than you were. I noticed that and got her painting lessons. And so that's how I started painting, by the way. Oh, and that's how I started painting. By the way, I'm better than you. She's a great flower person and gardener. When we were courting, she gave me food from her plate, which never fails to touch me. She has a temper, but she doesn't hold a grudge. <laughs> Next up, I would like to call Moira O'Brien. I signed up for his um, American Lit class, uh, and it was taught by Michael O'Brien instead. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the one of the many gifts that Michael gave me was an introduction to Klein, and and through Klein meeting his family and Zarita, and. One thing I could say about Klein and his level of commitment is he puts his back into everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably is at times mulish, mm -hmm. but um, he always shows a strong commitment. Uh, so I'd like to read a poem about moving a refrigerator, which <laughs> was <laughs> gifted to Michael and me. Um, and this refrigerator, this was back in like mid-1980s, and this refrigerator, there were no lightweight components in this refrigerator. It was a behemoth. So uh, it was nice to have the gift, but the move was um, traumatic. The refrigerator. A rare moment of equilibrium balanced the felt impossibility of getting this refrigerator <clears> up the <throat> stairs or back down again either. These deep breathing folks look too ridiculous to stay unbothered long. Help arrives soon in the form of a Spanish man with a too short dolly. Cerveza, don't worry, he's loco. Bless the heft. Bless the reserves, never called on before. Mm -hmm. Bless the footprint on the wall. Mm -hmm. Bless standing it on the wrong end. Mm -hmm. Bless tipping it over again. Mm -hmm. Bless the Spanish man. Bless the little wife. Ice cream, refrigerator, gracias. Bless two friends who found impossibility a motive again. <laughs> I now call up Melanie. <laughs> How long have you known her for? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I'm in good company because um, I also learned everything I know about poetry from. So. Dad. <laughs> but it was a little different maybe than how it happened for other people. <laughs> I remember uh, being here with him when I was a kid, you know, in the office of the English department and he had to go to class. He said, write a poem and I'll be, I'll be back. <laughs> that was how it started. And then later on I got to be like 14, 15 and he would give me, you know, he'd sit me at the kitchen table and give me his manuscript. It would be like a stack of poems like this with a binder clip on and give me a pencil and he said, figure out how this can be better. How can they be better? <laughs> so I would sit there and I would think about it and then, you know, I would try to figure out how they could be better, how the order could be better. And then we would go through it and talk about it. He'd argue about it. He'd tell me why I was mostly wrong. <laughs> and, uh, the poem I'm gonna read is one that was in that group for a long time. 
uh, and it was one that where it's the first one that came to mind when I thought, what poem of dad would I do? Uh, because it's one of the ones where I first noticed that little lift off that happens at the end, you know, it just kind of takes off mm -hmm. and there's that levitation. So this is Little Moon. Little Moon, you're a triangle almost in the dusk tonight. And I can almost see what I only first saw when I looked through my neighbor's binoculars, that your blurred edge curves toward me. Now I can see it with a naked eye. And I wonder that the ancients, not knowing what to look for, couldn't. I envy the man I should know, could probably guess, who discovered the secret of your chimerical light. You were a keyhole through which he saw not a monster, but a bit of a highly intriguing game, which he must have seen had been going on a long time, and of which, contrary to experience, he was a part. You gave him a heart-beating moment, little star, like in a palace somewhere when some loafers playing with ranks and files, buttons and odd metals, invented the night and began seeing around corners and hopping over each other. Hmm. Uh, next up, Pamela Hughes. Would you please come? So both poets Jim Klein and Mike O'Brien were my professors at Fairleigh Dickinson right here, former, formerly. Um, really my doctors, and the medicine that they gave me was poetry. Before coming to Fairleigh Dickinson as a freshman here, again on this campus, I thought that poetry was old-fashioned and boring until I met Klein and O'Brien and had them as my literature and creative writing professors. Although both guys were wonderful academicians, there was nothing there was something a lot more fascinating about them. Both were, were wild poet types. The phrase, <laughs> the phrase reckless intensity always came to mind with Jim in particular. <laughs> to him, it seemed that a rash action was a form of ecstasy, <clears throat> the ex part meaning moving away from stasis or the stayed. In honor of him, when I became a creative writing teacher at Bloomfield College, I used to bring my students to a nearby park, have them swing wildly out on the swings and jump off so they could feel the, the life in their bodies, then write about the joy of motion or childhood. So thanks, Klein and O'Brien, for giving me the, both the door into literature and into the wilds of poetry. Yeah. Oh. So I thought it would be apropos to read 220 Mantras Ave. Mm -hmm. I work as a poet in the attic room of a house, which is a college building. There is a green rug, there is a telephone, there are four desks, mine and three empty. If anyone were so reckless to ask, is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> One a good day, on a good day, he might even get seven. Sometimes I wonder, this is Rutherford, maybe William Carlos Williams was once in this house. Maybe he hugged lugged, I'm sorry, lugged a box of Christmas decorations into this room where I am working. Mm. And just one more. Let's see, who is that? The Shawl of Truth. Mm. The Shawl of Truth. If you're guilty, shut up. But if you're innocent, talk and keep talking. And someday it will make sense somehow because no one will knit the Shawl of Truth the way truth knits itself. <laughs> uh, now for some of the Red Wheel Barrow new guard. How about uh, Claudia Soraya, why don't you come up? Whoa. time. I was uh, uh, remembering this morning when I, I wrote a few things to read about Jim. Um, when I met Jim in 2006 it was, I think it was, uh, um, I'm not sure if it was the first time when the Red Wheel Barrel workshop happened at the library in the glass room, but I remember precisely 
that everyone in that room were a few of us, so George De Gregorio, Jim, I don't know if Sandra was there, Sandra the singer, Bollier, and others. Uh, so we went around the room and everyone introduced themselves and I was amazed and um, so Jim was the only English professor and everyone else had other professions and I was amazed, you know, how this can happen. Uh, people who don't really have, do poetry professionally or are not really in that field. Uh, get together and just do it for fun. So I was uh, surprised by that. Um, so, and I also had a culture shock moment because uh, I came from Romania, like all my um, education, and I knew, I read some American poets, but it this was the first time when I met uh, real American poets, mm -hmm. the kinds of, you know, you see in anthologies, for instance, I didn't, necessarily know the names, but I kind of got my first direct contact with the American poetry. And so European, Romania, uh, abstract, uh, symbolistic, surreal, uh, and then here we go with uh, American realism and the Polish West housewives. And so I was shocked, and then I kind of had to accept that mm -hmm. and understand it and wrap my head around it. Uh, and so uh, Jim was, as a poetry uh, workshop leader, I thought of him like the Simon Cowell kind of guy. <laughs> Who would tell you if he had no business of writing any kind of poetry? Um, and uh, uh, I learned many things in this workshop and from him. Um, one of the things that I was struggling with is because uh, um, this was 2006, and so I started writing poetry in English uh, just a couple of years earlier, and um, my English is a second language, and I was very timid and minimalistic, and that reflected my relationship with English, uh, the language, and so he encouraged me to write in that stronger voice, find that stronger voice, mm. um, kind of like find that confidence, which I guess came with time, mm. but for sure um, he um, encouraged that for sure. And the last thing that I wanted to say that uh, he wanted to have fun. And uh, he said once that if, um, if it's not fun, you might not, might as well not do it, and no one should do or write anything if it feels like a chore. Mm. So, uh, on that note, I want to read a poem that is uh, a lot of fun to read, and it's kind of uh, playful and irreverent, and it's very Jim Klein, um, the horn player. Mm -hmm. Someone told me a horn player was just talking dirty into the trumpet, <laughs> saying, motherfucker, motherfucker, fucking motherfucker, fuck you. But he came out a brilliant horn riff. A friend let me play his drum last night. What a time I had, but I wanted to get a song going, so I played motherfucker, 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 and it came out a nice clean beat. I added motherfucker, motherfucker, motherfucking jingle bells, and it was even better. <laughs> he came down to the basement and we smoked a joint. I told him what I was doing and he thought it a good idea. We went upstairs, he played guitar, I drummed on a chair, and we fucked and sucked everyone we could think of. <laughs> George said other people wouldn't understand. <laughs> but I said America was teaching little kids one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and boring them to death when they could learn motherfucking jingle bells right away and be happy, and that was the way America ruined everything. <laughs> but the key is to have the right person read the right poem. Uh, Frank Rubino shows what you got. All right. Hello, everybody. Hi, Hello, Frank. <laughs>
<laughs> How you doing? Uh, I'm going to actually ask John Trous to come and join me for a part of this, but uh, for Red Wheelbarrow 15, I persuaded the editors, of whom I was one, to uh, let me write about Jim Klein's painting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned to Jim that I was going to do it, and it took me a while to, to get what I wanted to you know, to pull it together. I finally was ready with it. And um, I, I wrote to Jim, I've got this, you know, I've finished this thing, I wanna send it to you. And he replied to me with the poem that I'm gonna to read tonight. But once I sent this manuscript of this essay to him, he just went quiet. Like I didn't hear from him and I'm like, oh my God, what did I do? What, what happened? Did I, I mean, it was, it was really like, um, I got to a point where I sort of desperately sent an email saying, you know, did, did you hate it? Was it, is it horrible what I wrote about your painting? And, uh, finally I saw him and he didn't even respond. Then I saw him in person and he said, oh yeah, you know, it, uh, it wasn't all bullshit, you know, so, <laughs> so I gotta read a little bit from it. Um, it's called Jim Klein Action Painter. <laughs> Once Jim Klein took life drawing classes and they were bad, they were hard as life classes are, foreshortenings impossible. Then sometime in the late 80s, he drew a perfect drawing by not thinking about it. In 2022, Jim Klein's attic wall is splashed and smeared with paint. The edges of the room where the slope of the roof gets close to the floor and you can't stand are crammed with paintings of all sizes, mostly on canvas. There are rugs on the attic floor, candy frosted with remaindered house paint, a medium of choice. When I visit, I smell linseed oil, a happy old smell for me because my mother is a painter and turpentine soaked rags were part of my childhood. From their quantity stacked in rows, eight deep across the attic walls, cramming the upstairs hallway, and hung salon style over every square inch of wall space, these paintings seem to be pushing themselves out of bounds. At the same time, they seem to hew to a 1950s protocol, first mm -hmm. identified by a critic Harold Rosenberg, mm -hmm. action painting. The automatic roots of action painting practiced by Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, and others have been traced to surrealists who were trying to promote the subconscious to an unmediated creative power. Klein says that while he's painting, some area on the canvas will light up, asserting itself as the next focus of his attention. He's talked about lines he had made on one drawing turning red, demanding with this subconscious signal to be painted over. And now I'm going to read a poem that he sent to me. And John J. Trouse is going to help me. Um, it's also a poem that's kind of very musical. You know, Jim, Jim writes uh, a lot about music. Music's uh, oh, he's playing very important. This is called Beethoven's Ninth. Just trying to cover everywhere, always turning left. Just trying to cover when a strip of brown is fun, building the brown up and the idea becomes that surface everywhere, all the time painting to the ninth with both hands on the always shifting painting, moving it left, then it's getting too dark, so more white, more yellow. Now where's the red? And here comes the chorus, and it reminds me of a vaulting, happy little boy on his father's knee and his sisters and his own daughter. Hoff, 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 Ferk hinauf Golob, über Stock und über, über Steine, aber brich der nicht die Beine. Hoff, 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 Ferk hinauf Golob. Hop, 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 Pony goes gallop over sticks and over stones, but he never breaks his bones. And he's in the painting now, in the red paint, nothing but red on his father's knee again, desperately, into the rest of the red, fast until he's done, the singing's done, and he sits 
listening to the music, almost thinking it started over again until it's done. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. Everybody's got a poem that Jim Klein wrote for them, <laughs> except me. <laughs> Just wanted to say that. You know, I heard this joke when I was young, and I thought it was kind of clever. I was in college at the time, and someone asked me if how it was that colleges were known as the repositories of learning, and it was the answer. The clever answer was well, because everybody comes into college knowing everything. And when they leave, they realize they don't know anything. So the college must be the repository of all that learning that they left behind. And I kind of feel that way about Jim. Um, because we all come into poetry thinking we know every, oh, we know Shakespeare. I know Sonnet 124 and 129 by heart and all this stuff. And then you leave that workshop and you say, well, I guess I got to start all over again. Like that guy with the black painting. And uh, that happened to me, it happened to me as well. And for me, uh, the main lesson I got from Jim was uh, uh, the lesson of the hedgehog and the fox. The hedgehog who knows one thing and keeps at it, and the fox who knows many things. Actually, he borrowed that one, but I'm gonna give him credit for it. And uh, he said, yeah told me I was a fox, not a hedgehog, and I had to go home and think about that for five years. <laughs> Another thing I learned from Jim that I think Frank learned it tonight, I could see, and Melanie learned it, which is carry your poem in your back pocket, and then when you get up here, take your poem out and read it. And um, I'll just tell one little story about Jim that I think is on the level of the symposium stories that Della was telling, which was that we were over there in the Williams Center, having already been in, when I joined the workshop, I believe it was in City Hall in the blue room on the second floor. It was temporarily there. And then we moved into the Williams Center and we got the kindergarten room, which was a wonderful <laughs> place to be infantile, which was sort of the point. And then we had been there for a few years, and then the board of the Williams Center got a new bunch of assholes running it, and they wanted us to pay to stay in that room. And I never saw Jim as insulted by anything. We, we, we are the poets of the Williams Center, and these assholes want us to pay? They should be paying us! I went on with that for quite a while. <laughs> anyway, I think that's all my little notes that I got for before I say what I wanted to say about yeah, when the bozo was a poem in the back pocket. No sh oh yeah, and isn't it great? We've been here for an hour and we've heard no shitty poems. No one <laughs> shitty poem the whole time. Can't figure that out. Anyway. I wanted to read a poem called Umbriagos from the pre-embroidered moment, which I wrote a review of some years ago when it first came out. But typical of me, I'm not just going to read the poem. First, I'm going to tell you all about the poem. Because when I read the poem, and this is the height of my hubris, when I read the poem, I kept getting more and more out of it as I read it and went back and read over it again. So since I'm only going to read the poem one time, I thought I'd tell you everything that I learned about the poem first. And uh, so I love this poem, Umbriagos. Umbriagos means um, either drunk or drunkards or town fool. Or, and it's a poem I love because of its slapdash comedy. It's like a movie cross between a Marx Brothers movie and if you know Malcolm Lowry, Under the Volcano. It's got all of that in one place. So I want to talk to you just a little bit about it first. So it means drunks village fool, and the poem presents us with three drunks in a car pulling over at a liquor store where a fight breaks out among them. The three drunks are the speaker, presumably Jim, another guy named Terry from Bethlehem, PA, and Susan. The fight breaks out between the speaker and Terry in the front seat of the car, 
but spills out onto the street when Susan, quote, sails out of the back seat, end quote, and knocks Terry back across the sidewalk, at which point Jim scrambles out of the car and rolls under it. At this point, the action of the, the, action of the poem just stops dead in its tracks, and the fighting stops, and the poem moves from a regular type into italics, while Jim, lying under the car, has time to meditate on how the three of them ever got into this fix. At first, he compares the three of them to characters from a William Faulkner story, The Bear, how they were all fused into statutory. And then he considers the psychological therapy called abreaction, whereby repressed ideas are released through verbalization. And as his interior monologue continues, he reaches the conclusion that his way of releasing repressed ideas differs from the therapeutic method. <laughs> Sorry, that was what would happen when we were reading poems and Jim was a little tired. Uh, and so, uh, you know, his way of doing that was to actually uh, get involved in a ruckus and then in this amazing phrase, drive off the safe and goad the residuum into acting out the family romance. And then in a moment of true psychological penetration, really staggeringly ordinary for a man if he's drunk enough, he summarizes the family romance that he relives through this abreaction. I love daddy for hitting me. I hated mommy for not stopping him. Then, as suddenly as the action stopped for this meditation, the fight starts up again with Terry out on the sidewalk, hitting Susan, who falls and would have hit her head on the curb, if not for the fact that, as Jim puts it, in the choreography of the thing, her head fell on Jim's leg, the only part of me sticking out from under the car, leading to what might be the most beautiful and perfectly drunk romantic ending in the history of world literature, as he remembers that the very leg on which Susan's head was cushioned from injury during this fight is the same leg that she once examined in an early morning light and pronounced perfect. <laughs> now, having ruined the poem for you, I will read it to you. Umbriagos. Terry says, pull over here, here, by this liquor store. I bent the ignition key flat. I ripped the rear view mirror down. Terry tore his visor down. Then he pulled his gloves on, slowly opened the door, almost stepped out and lunged back in swinging at me. I buried my squealing head in his chest and Susan, sailed out of the back seat and drove this winner of hundreds of bar fights out of the pitching VW back across the sidewalk and I scrambled out under the car. Lying there, I had time to think how the three of us fit together, even in some ways bitterly so. I remembered Boone, Lion, and old Ben fused into statu statuary in the bear. And ab reaction, the discharge of emotional energy supposed to be attached to a repressed idea, especially by verbalization in the presence of a therapist. My way had been to stage my own ab reaction, to work up a ruckus and attract the dangerous even Terry from Bethlehem, PA, and then drive off the safe and goad the residuum into acting out the family romance. I love daddy for hitting me. I hated mommy for not stopping him. When he hit her, she fell straight back and would have hit her head on the curb if in the choreography of the thing, it hadn't landed on my left leg just above the knee, the only part of me sticking out from under the car, a leg she once examined in an early morning light and pronounced 
perfect. <laughs> Thank you all. Here's someone who goes back a ways with Jim, Dan Saxon. Yeah! Jim, I go back to Jim to the lunch days. We go back to reading in Englewood on cold days at the Englewood Library. Years and years and years. And Jim has always opened his heart to everybody, taking leadership positions, which is very difficult as a poet. It's a lonely field being a poet, and we need other poets to support us in whatever we do. And there was Jim, publishing magazine, lunch magazine, which goes back, and many of you know, and I see people in the room, Maura, Bella, John, we've been doing this for years and years. And sometimes we go away from it, and sometimes we come back, but there was Jim. Jim was at lunch, Jim was an editor. Jim brought us out of ourselves. Jim asked me to talk about publishing poetry in the 1960s, which I did as publisher of Poets at the Metro. Yeah, tell us about it. Uh, tell us about it now. You mentioned the name, and they published. I published them in their magazine. Kring, Legetti, Corso, Orlovsky, Ginsburg, Berrigan. They're all in my magazine. They're at the in many libraries around the country. But thanks, Jim, for asking for asking me to mimeograph magazine. Wow. Yeah, get Stedna. We pumped it out, <laughs> sent it out. We had the bookstores. These are rare books. You can't even buy them now. If anyone finds one, please let me know. But Jim inspired me to write it. Then they put my uh, thoughts in uh, edition six. And uh, I just want to thank you, Jim, for being a leader of this and being. A great poet. Thank you, Dan. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Rick Mullen, come on up. Oh! Um, <clears throat> I met Jim in the 21st century. We don't go back that far. <laughs> Ooh. Um, Jim is an incredibly generous man. I spent a day with him and Zarita at their home where he and I went over one of my poems after learning that I don't do anything right. He went upstairs and painted. <laughs> I've got to tell you that there's one thing that Jim taught me. And, and that is, uh, he taught me which hands to use when you let go of the side of the pool. And that's going to be a challenge for the rest of my life. Thank you very much. I'll always remember that. I got a lot out of that day. What does that mean? Both hands. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I think you grabbed both my hands off the computer. <laughs> um, Della read to a reader, and I want to uh, second that choice. But under the circumstances, I shall read another of his many Ars Poeticas. Um, it's just wonderful views on, on, on life and art in his poetry. Style. Wouldn't it be the better part of bestness to have no style at all? To be and always to have been just there, not to beam signals, not to be as undramatic as, but to be as undramatic as blocking out a scene actual as a knot on the wall. Who could say it better than part of the furniture? Neither brave nor bold, avoid ball player metaphor. <laughs> These agonies are so narrowing. Offer a pane of glass instead. Have you no toughness? Let artifice lie in what's withheld. Other singers have looked within and found new values in old songs. You need to do the same. Thank you, Jim. Uh, the big guns are here. Joel Lewis, please come up. Whoa. Hello, folks. Hello. 
I saw a notice in, the, in my email box and I felt it'd be good to come up. I came with a little bit of trepidation on the train from Hoboken because I expected Jim be in a gurney. <laughs> this is why they put this together. But I see that you could have joined Marlon Brando's group uh, in the Wild Ones. Looking <laughs> good. Um, I wanted to start to do a flip on Walt Whitman's term uh, phrase, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. My flip is that organizers are the unacknowledged legislators of poetry. And this is what Jim has been doing for years. I've done this myself and it's, you know, a lot of people hating you, you know, you know, you know, so, you know sometimes doing this and he, um, particularly what I liked about the Red Wheelbarrow series, which I thought was unique among series that have features and opens, that it also had a workshop, you know, which you don't see. And it also had somebody giving a little talk you know, on this. You know, I, I've done some of the talks and I remember feeling the eyeballs of the open readers <laughs> behind <laughs> trying to get this done. And I thought this is important because a lot of series in that format simply become less art and just kind of a thing, kind of get here, you come and learn, you develop something, you learn about a poet, might improve your craft in doing that. You know, and I think that is like a really good idea. Uh, I go back with Jim from the late 70s. I didn't get to the lunch readings, although I heard about the readings and more a little kind of 79, 80, which was a kind of interesting people who were not around was this kind of weird moment in working class suburban New Jersey where there was just like a lot of poetry happening. It was readings and Passaic, Patterson had readings uh, all over the place. Uh, there was a thing called Cedar Grants. Do people remember Cedar Grants? This was something that was, was put in during Jimmy Carter's administration to sort of give work to a lot of people with college degrees who were walking around, you know, working in like John's Bargain Store and, you know, and things like that. So Lynnhurst, of all places in the universe, had a little poetry center that gave workshops and had readings and other people had this. And this created this kind of groundswell of interest. Uh, there was still like a lot of younger people in this area because you could afford to live here. Uh, people who were still going to community colleges. So it was like a kind of young people's. And then one day, you know, particularly once the CEDA programs ended when Reagan got into office, it kind of, you know, went away. Um, and uh, I've always admired, you know, Jim's organizing skills. I admired his work, uh, particularly the way he writes about his bipolarism, mm -hmm. and it's not theatricalized. And as, as someone who experiences this from my family, <laughs> it rings true, you know, you know, you know, in terms of the experiences that he did. And I appreciate the fact that people decided to sort of honor him because this doesn't happen that often unless you're like in a gurney, you know, uh, or after the gurney, you're here to, you know, you know, you know, appreciate it and hear that people really respect what you've done because, you know, there's not any remuneration <laughs> and you don't get famous or, you know, or anything like that. And they don't put you on the town council or, you know, or they should name a street after you. <laughs> you know, that's something. How many people live here in Rutherford? Well, we got to get more people up here, but someone, just, <laughs> someone should get like some kind of hobo. I live in Hoboken and we're full of these little streets, you know, Bobby, the, the peddler Ferranti way. I mean, I have no idea who these people are, but they, they, they kind of do that. And I think it would be nice that they should put a little doodad, you know. And why are there no traffic lights in town? I don't know. Okay, because I was like, this is this is a town with no traffic. Yeah. You know, I, I guess they want to keep the population, you know, you, you know, down. <laughs> you know, so 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 people in town should really start a petition or something like that. You know, I think this would be you know really really appropriate. So my hats off to you. Thank you, Joel. <laughs>
How you doing, Jim? Hey, Ron. I have in my hand a cento of lines from Jim Klein poems. All right. Whoa! <laughs> and the title, even the title, is uh, from his one of his poems. It's called "To Make a Climb." Explain what a cento. A cento is a collection of lines of someone's poems. <laughs> well, Isn't it a hundred lines long and stuff like that? Excuse me? Isn't it a hundred lines long? Uh, That's I don't think so. The Renaissance that became a tradition because the word cento, which means patchwork quilt in Latin, going back to the Greek, kentron, in Italian it's cent. It's cento, which they associate with the number 100. But it doesn't have to have 100 lines. Yeah, I, I didn't have 100 lines. <laughs> <laughs> Just embarrass the hell out of them. Go ahead. <laughs> to make a climb. To make a climb become the poem. Rhetoric gentle. Lubricated. A horse delivered whole. Naked. Crosswise to roars of laughter. At least we can try to be wrong, but with a clear conscience, which is another useless fiction. <laughs> Fixing winter disrepair early in the spring of, in, of inanimate objects with my mother. That was a happy day. <laughs> That's it. I first met Jim Klein in 2013 at a red wheelbarrow reading, but the name seemed familiar. Later I saw that he and I and George Ferretti and Allen Ginsberg and Laura Boss had all been in Passaic Review number one in 1979 with a poem about Jim and Melanie. Nice. And I saw that his poetry retained its starkness, its realness, though ripened through the years. Thank you. Next up, Mike Manza. Come on down. Try to keep this short. <clears throat> Thank you. And um, I haven't known you forever. I'm so glad that everybody has because it's just enriching everything that I've known about you and, and, and what I feel. Um, I think I met met you in 2015, 2016 at one of the readings. You come up to me after the reading and says, Hey, we do a workshop. Why don't you come over? I was like, <laughs> Boy, did I get my ass kicked. It was fun. Oh, it, was, it was fun. It was fun. And um, it, it, it's just one of those things where I couldn't, I couldn't stop listening. I, it just, every time I heard something, it just, it, I had to keep, it, I, it, I kept hearing it. And we just got to talking about stuff and my day job, I work for, I've been in the energy business for 40 years. And one day he says to me, he says, yeah, I'm getting these bills for public service. I got solar on my roof, blah, 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 blah. He says, come on over, take a look at the house. See what you got. Go over there, he makes me lunch. I had this great butternut soup, butternut squash soup. The cook was amazing. I mean, she, the soup was just <laughs> unbelievable. Makes me a nice sandwich. I'm looking at the solar panels. How many poets you know got solar panels on the roof? <laughs> Not me. Um, anyway, we got, got to, and he says, well, come here, I want to show you something. So, go upstairs. Oh. I'm looking at the pit. My God, I'm looking at this stuff. I'm walking around. My head was spinning. Your paintings, I never saw anything the same after that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. But I had to give something back to you. It's not something you wrote. It's something I wrote. And it, I, I just, I had this image for a long time after I came out of your house. It was a rough diamond, rough diamond under the lights. 
What I liked about Jim <clears throat> is that <clears throat> he answered the phone when I called him from left field and did not pretend to know who I was. <laughs> he shook off the signal from behind home plate. Then he stretched, kicked, twisted to deliver a strike that would have put the game away. But I tipped it foul. Blue dropped a new utter smooth ball into the catcher's upturned mitt. Unscuffed, it got tossed back into play. That's when Jim's cold eye wired a busy signal. He picked up the rosin bag, spit a bullet into the mound. He scuffed the ball, settled in his glove. Before I stepped back into the batter's box to work the count, I knocked my spikes clean, just in case he does remember me. One way or another, I'm gonna keep calling until he does. Now, I'm a washed canvas, stretched with off-white sizing. Jim's filling the blanks, brush, screwballs, color with meaning. As he knuckles a called strike three, right past me. Then on my way back to the dugout, I kick clay dust, flop my sorry ass down on the bench, just an abstract sour puss. Scraping unrhymable pigments mm. from my teeth. <laughs> Next up, yeah, he wrote it. Janet Colstein. Oh. into the library for the poetry session and they go wow this guy he looks like he's from a 1930s movie <laughs> he's like a 1930s movie star like Henry Fonda or Gary Cooper or something definitely Midwest Hollywood <laughs> and we started reading the poems or so I'm listening to the poems and I thought sounds great and then Jim took out his knives <laughs> and his comma meter. Yeah. And I thought, no, it's not good. It, it, it could be made better. And it was made better. And I learned at that point, don't be married so much to your first draft or your second draft or your third draft because it's all, it can always be made better. Generally, so um, and that was a long time ago. And now I will read a poem that I liked from Red, Wheel, Red Wheelbarrow Nine, called "Early in the Spring." I mowed the lawn today. The lawn was covered with tiny oaks early in the spring. The grass was wet, but I didn't realize it was making the lawnmower hard to push. And I pushed as hard as I could with rubbery arms and wiped out all those little acorns like so many weak old man poems. <laughs> And it came to me that I was like this big oak tree above me. And all these were my multitudinous wasted offspring. Just another harvestless effusion trailing behind me day after day. And there were no worries. I was this indifferent, profuse tree, dumbly above me.
Which book is the slow reading group in? It's in uh, Green Burger. Mm -hmm. I have Green Burger. I'll find it for you. Here's the index. <laughs> table of contents. I'm looking at the table of contents. <laughs> Oh, it's here, on page it, 26. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, guys. This we poem. Can uh, to read it together. This poem breaks my heart, and I hope it breaks yours. The slow reading group. In the second grade, I was in the slow reading group. So my mother and I read together in my bed each night, and she hugged me and kissed me, and really loved me longer than necessary. Then I get into the fast reading group. <laughs> Jim, it's on you now. Come on up here. two poems. Uh, Mark, Mark read the goat. So I wanted him to read it because he's my first publisher. And I want to read uh, Dooney's. It's uh, 129 in that book. One copy. No, this doesn't have that many pages. <laughs> 20, on 29, maybe. Melanie, where is it? Yeah, it's on 29. Not I told you I was tired. Thank you, uh, Arthur, for reading that poem, because I think it's so hard. It's just about too hard to read poetry. It, it definitely was hard at first, but it got better and better. It's like a symphony. I love that poem. Well, uh, the apple doesn't fall far from the pear tree. <laughs> so I have to explain uh, Dooney's. I was having uh, an episode, as whoever says that. Robert and Duvall and I was out of my mind. <laughs> Her name was Denise. I could give you the last name, but. She's got enough in for me. <laughs> Sometime if we uh, drink enough, I'll tell you all the stories. <clears throat> but she thought I should take some pills in my, in my own house. And I, I wasn't inclined to, so she, she waved her fanny at me. And I took it the wrong way. I, I thought, you know, I thought she was inviting me. <laughs> so I, uh, when I woke up, locked up in Bergen Pines or, or uh, Greystone, in isolation. <clears throat> I was singing, do knees, do knees. I thought we were Indians. I 
I could have chosen an easier poem to read, <laughs> but I don't think that's what Miles would do. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, about sunup, I found your Mustang and got in and read in your notebook a poem about us running away and leaving those two, and I took the only thing I had taken from home, a piece of pipe stone from Indiana inscribed, and Indian scalps his enemies, but the white man kills his friend, and jabbed it in your radio. No one answered the doorbell. I got impatient and tried to make phone calls. The lady from the cleaners making me pay and threatening to call the cops. Anyhow, you two set me up for a straight jacket and a short ride as an armless king in a sedan chair. Doonies, I was so in love with you that day in the quiet room mm -hmm. with no furniture. I kept hearing someone else's voice as yours. I kept yelling, Doonies, Doonies. I thought a filthy fat man asleep on a sagging leather couch was in charge and tried to communicate using bird songs. They said I froze up and got up and massaged. Don't remember, I thought I was making a film for the FBI shot out of the light. I lay on my back and made discreet hand signs. Several quaternities were scrawled on the wall. Mm -hmm. You all know what a quaternity is? Yeah. A list? A list? Sometimes I'm it's poor. the the tri uh, 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 three would be a, a trinity, right? Yeah. Right. But a quaternity it is the devil is filled in. Uh, so it's a lot older. Several quaternities were scrawled on the wall. Is that right, Melanie? I have no idea. Oh, you didn't look it up? I looked it up. <laughs> okay. That's what it was. I kept hearing your voice at the nurse's station. So I was saying, do knees, do knees. And it's, it's, uh, ho, ho, ho. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Eberstecken, Eberstein, and Aberbrister, and uh, uh, Nietzsche Bein, and Which, you know what it means, okay. There were numbers and letters on my sweatshirt. I was the perfect computer and the ultimate bomb. And I programmed finger flash numbers into myself. Mm -hmm. multiplying myself mm -hmm. into my heart acorn desire for you yep. knowing when I exploded into mist out of there I would be riding horses in the mountains with you and our son and we would be Indians I'm from South Dakota That means a lot to me. I went into the corner and slid my head down the two walls and said goodbye to everyone I loved and to my wife and child. I loved you so much, Dunez. Dunez, I'm getting another girl at a party where I'm typing this on the floor. They wouldn't let me out and I made a key to the screens that wouldn't work and arranged E equals MCC with a Paul Mall pack. You know who's Michael Bryan. 
and tried to kick the screens in, which is why Albie Guzzo wanted to be my friend. I showed the cigarette physics to an orderly, Paula Liberté, who was really a painter and carried a switchblade and threatened to kill me with, with it in my own living room a month later, mm. sticking it in the floor repeatedly while my wife froze in our bed. Denise, Denise, I pissed in a drain I named Norman Mailer. <laughs> and that was the day we could have made it. And now we never will because one of us made a mistake, I loved you so much. Uh, <laughs> I'm re I read that poem because Mark and I have a mutual friend Kathy Kunzel, who used to be, was the best writer from Indiana, from Rutherford, and uh, her readings at lunch were, um, were uh, a major, I'm trying to say this, reading group goes back many years deeply. So Kathy, Mark told Kathy that I was not feeling well. And he, she called me. I hadn't talked to her for 10 years. And she called me because I was flat on my back. And she says, you know, if I'm, if I'm gonna be there, I would read Dooney's. <laughs> hey Jim, would you read the happiest part of the day? Oh, it's the last poem in the first section. Okay, that that was another uh, poem from being incarcerated. Yeah. The happiest time of the day was after the evening meal when I had one cigarette saved. That was mine. Cigarettes are money in the... Uh, I'd get a light a walk to the head and watch the sun set through the heavy bolted screen and pretend I had put in a hard day on the farm and truly earn my keep. go home now. So I'd like to shake your hand. I'd like to stay seated while you, while I shake your hand. <laughs> Why don't we line up then? Shake his hand. Absolutely. Receiving line. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for reading that poem. My pleasure, really. Thank you. Love you, man. Thank you, thank you, sister. Thank you, thank you. Well, I didn't mean everybody had it. Oh, that's the way I had you did it. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. I want to get it off. Mm. Mm. Uh, Got an open mic to uh, come. I could use it. Take this moment to uh, use the two, one of the two bathrooms. Mm. One is called Jim and one is called Not Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when uh, you and I and the uh, uh, yeah. 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 
for one copy of pre embroidered mm. Oh, it wasn't me. I bought mine years ago. <laughs> that was a strange. I just want to make that clear. Three years. Three years. I might just read it. Oh, my God. Jim John Gall. I know who you are. What's up, Frank? Hey. How are you, brother? Good, man. What's happening? Uh, you know, same, same shit, different day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks. Is that it is handmade, yeah. Nice. Yeah, from uh, one, of, one of the parks when they down in, uh, what was it? Um, it's a park down in Monmouth County where they always have the um, have like Christmas walks and ghost walks. It's like um, they they have iron making and all that stuff. We made a name of it, but they, you know they have craft fairs like and all that. Is it a lair? A lair. It yeah. is a lair. I knew because I, I remember the iron making. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It had it smelt yeah. old smelt yeah. walls. Frank, how are you? Yes, good. I'm, how are you I'm doing? Joe Lewis. Joel, it's been forever. I, I, I mean, I saw you reading at the School of Visual Arts. Oh my God! Wow, that was amazing. Yes, yes, yes. How you been? Good, good. Yeah. What are you up to? Um, just retired as a social worker oh, in Staten wow. Island. Yeah. And I live in Hoboken. And I'm working on a new book for Hanging Blues. I would suggest coming out. I mean, I heard that you have like kids and stuff. Yeah. How, how young are they? Are you uh, they're, they're, they're grown. Oh, okay. So yeah. I, I would suggest coming. This is my wife, Barbara. Hi. Hi. There's a good series at the Bowery Poetry Club yeah. run by Bob Rosenzall and Ed Friedman. And it's just, you know, people who are okay. cohort. Oh, yeah. It's Tuesday night. Go to the Bowery Poetry Club web website, and it's 7.30 to 9. There's like three poets, you know, reading. It's free. It's, it's great. You know, so, well, what happened at the project is kind of this younger cohort yes. came in. Yes. Um, 
you know, I knew, you know, and people, like, and I knew when Eleanor Nowen was pissed. Right. Who used to, right. like, yell at me for not, like, you know, renewing my membership. I get a call, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, so it's, it's the age thing and also the shift in poetry among mm-hmm. younger people. Yes, which is poetic. It's, it's more, you know, it's more identity. You know, it's more identity thing. You know, uh, if, if you look at, at the project, it's just... Yeah, no, I, you know, I, I, I so, 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 so the thing is, the thing is past, yeah. the power of poetry, yeah. so you know, all people I know, you know, oh. you know, so are you from Jersey? Or you yeah, from I'm from New Jersey, Jersey. I live in, um, well, I grew up here, and I live in um, Montclair, so, a good place for uh, the arts, and it's a great, great place, you know, <laughs> you know uh, people from our synagogue, that's where they, from Hoboken, he used to joke we called Montclair Hoboken West. Oh, you know, you know, well, it's also been called Brooklyn, Brooklyn West. <laughs> yeah, it, it has that, you know, yeah. it, you know, it has that sort of atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. you know, well, thank you for letting me know about that. That sounds great. My, my only conflict might be that Arthur and I run this uh, post, I should say, we run this poetry workshop every Tuesday night. Oh, ah, okay. So that's a, that's a tough night for me. Yeah, but, but it's, a, you know, it's a, it's a fun series. It sounds great. You know, um, you know, you know and uh, like, like Ann Brower showed up. Oh, my God. I mean, I had not heard that. You know, and I, somebody told me she was not doing well health-wise, you know, but as I said, this is the altercocker. Uh-huh. Which is a Yiddish expression that means old farts, you oh. know, alter old copper. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You, know, you, see, you know, so uh, well, oh, you know, so it's, you know, you know, you know, mostly kind of an older cohort doing that. But it's just, you know, readings are good, you know, and yeah, sure. people finally have now for the first time in a few years a place to read and you know, kind of get, yeah, you know, because there's no really nobody lives. A few people like Greg Masters. Still live at 437. Uh-huh. Uh, but most people have yeah. gone to Brooklyn. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know. So I would recommend it. You know. I will I will try. I will come and check it out. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and I and I know Jim as I said in my talk, like from amazing yeah. Yeah. and I took a look and I said, Is he okay? They have still, you know, like a community. I mean, I wish you were younger, but I think as I kind of, you know, this is, well, you grew up in this area, you could live in places like North Arlington. Mm-hmm. Sure. You could get a big house, yes. pay a few hundred dollars, yes. you know, yes. Um, yes. you know, all these places, you know, in Paris were inexpensive, and, you know, it's that kind of. Uh, I grew up in North Bergen. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Not yeah. Just, but in Hudson County. And before Hoboken, North Bergen was populated with a lot of artists and writers. Just, wow. There was not a community, yeah. but the rent was cheap. It was actually like not too cheap. You know, and then a lot of them kind of moved. Now, I, I ran a reading series in North Bergen. Wow. And Eileen came to oh, read. Yeah. Wow. Ted came. Wow. Uh, you know, you know, you know, Ted Berry, yes. you know, came to read. I probably read Ted Berry every day. Because I have his book. Well, well, Simon Shukit came. I don't know if you know him or not. But he's like, you know, I know, I know his name. He had left already. He was in the Foreign Service. He's Chinese for 25 years. Uh-huh. And if they hear the reading, yeah. um, it's the kind of Ted, you know, the Cento. You know, uh-huh. like, did you ever see the, my book of Ted's talks that I did? No, I'd love to see that. Hey, everybody, if we're going to have an open mic, hey, everybody, if we're going to have an open mic, you're going to have to sit back there. Let me just read I'm going to be going, oops, is this still on? So, oh, yeah. here's here. If you're looking for yeah. that, oh, yeah. Thank you. Let's get going. Yeah. Good night. Nice to see you. We're going to do the open mic. That's the kind of, you know, we just like, it's like what? It's like what? what uh, you know, 
It's like what Robert Frost said about life. It goes oh, on. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, John J. Krauss. I don't think he's leaving. I think he's saying goodbye to people. Good night, Mr. Morales. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. March 7th, reading at Cliffside Park. Cliffside Park. Yeah. 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 I love the way you do it. That's right. Yeah. 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 I'll be there. All right, we're doing this thing. Sal, you're first. Except Mark was first. <laughs> Welcome to the Red Wheelbarrow Open Mic for February of the year of our Lord, 2024. Uh, the rules of the open mic are quite simple. When someone's name is called, you must applaud until they get up here to give them the courage to say what they need to say. And when they're done, having expelled their souls into the air, you have to accompany them back to their chair with more applause. You have three minutes to read one poem. The first reader tonight is going to be the first reader. We always have a guy I love. He used to be the editor of the entire Red Wheelbarrow and the first publisher of Jim Klein's poems. His name is Mark Fogarty. Bring him up to the stage now. Come on. Thank you, everybody. This is a wonderful evening. Thanks to all you guys for organizing it. Um, I went through my stuff and I find that I have written one poem that I've dedicated to Jim, so I wanted to read that one uh, tonight. And uh, Jim and I, over the years, had a number of discussions about Resval. I spent a lot of time professionally on American Indian reservations. Jim grew up in South Dakota. He played Resval and survived it. And uh, so this poem uh, refers to that back about 10 years ago, there were two college sisters and they were kind of the epitome of res ball. Their names were Shoni and Jude Schimmel. And uh, so this one is, is about one of them. What is res ball, Mark? It's a reservation ball and yeah. with very sharp elbows. So like basketball? Or? Yeah, basketball. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, nice. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, there's a little sing-along at the end if you want to join me. All right. This is called uh, Jude Schimmel's Autograph, and it's for Jim Klein. I have in my phone, and I don't remember how, a photo of the autograph of Jude Schimmel. Probably something to do with one of my mentoring students. My student was a young woman from Louisville, where Jude played college ball, Kentucky kin. She called Jude for a story for our convention paper got the story. She said Jude was perfectly courteous, talked to her for an hour. Jude's signature is curved, kind of loopy, like a play you might design on a basketball court. Mm -hmm. She and Shoni and other Schimmel siblings too, grew up in Oregon playing res ball. Res ball is what you do instead of drink or drugs, because you have to have your wits about you. It's all sharp elbows, howitzer threes, Big attitude, loud territorial noises like the kind Serena made on the tennis court. Shoni was the queen of res ball, and Jude spent her youngish years shoveling her the ball in any open spot. I read Jude's memoir. It's the best memoir I've ever read. <laughs> Half of it is her story, mom and dad, res ball, Louisville, Shoni and Jude always together just a year apart. But the second half is an instructional for Indian girls. Kids with bright eyes mob her wherever she goes on reservations. You want to be like me, she asked. Here's what you do. Ten chapters of it, chapter and verse. How to be like Jude. I saw her play once, the year after Shoni graduated. Shorn from her other heart, but still good with one. She was slight, fast, a dancer of the lanes, the most efficient of point guards, the most noble, the most humble, fleet of speed and eye, finding her teammates in the places where you'd shoot and crash down on an opponent on a res court. Louisville won that day. 
I happened to sit behind the Louisville band. Drew didn't score many points, but when she did, the whole band rose to its feet and serenaded her. And suddenly I loved her, her grace, her speed, her autograph. And I sang along with the band who loved her every one. And really, I didn't have to write her this song of love and could have gone with the one we sang that day. Na, 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 hey, Judy. Na, 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 hey, Judy. This time, hey, Jim. Na, 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 hey, Thank you very much. Sal Raseo, get up here in the front of the room and read a poem to these starving people. Wow. Wow. Great start. So uh, I was uh, I was rereading a lot of Jim's stuff last night from from the two books I have from uh, Pre Embroidered Moment and um, and The Dumb Have the Advantage and uh, I just I just keep revisiting these old favorites and um, and I actually I started writing something that always you know made me think of Jim's uh, the way Jim's poems are they're they're very visceral and revealing and you you would think they're um, uh, you know, a little, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, vulnerable, but they're, they're not really, they're just, he, it's, they're just matter of fact, and I guess it's the way he phrases them, right? Um, so I, I, I started writing something called Alpha Primitive, but I, I, it's, it's not done, I, I didn't get to work on it too much, but um, instead I'm going to read uh, something, um, and there's so many great favorites, like I said, I mean, you could just thumb through and, and any one you hit is going to be a favorite, right? There's order, two orderlies, mm. there's murder, there's, um, uh, what's the last one? Uh, uh, Fortune versus Klein, so many favorites. But um, uh, here's one I really, really like. It's called Left Handed. Mm -hmm. If it was coming out of my left hand, why not let that hand set it down? It might slow me up enough for a grander dictation, if not more elegant wiring. Change and billfold move about on my body. Keys are another problem. Hmm. With jean jacket, too many possible looks. Hmm. I keep taking time out to reorganize, then wake up one morning barely able to speak. Though breakfast is doable, if almost inaudible, I sit there in a fright over my toast, but I know what they are saying. Almost every word. Mm. Dan, Dan Saxon, you still here? Yes. Ray lost me. Why do I lost? Is Ray Turco here? Ray, yeah. Ray, come read us a poem. Ray, Ray. Ray Turco. start by saying a few words about kind of how I met Jim just relatively quickly uh, so I was introduced to the Red Wheel Barrel Poets all of you I met all of you through Milton Ehrlich he found oh, out that I was a poet and he said why don't you uh, join the Red Wheel Barrel Poets I know them uh, and uh, why don't you check them out so I did but I only met Jim until much much later after the pandemic was pretty much over uh, because we met I was sitting right back there right next to John Trouse and Jim sat next to me and we struck up a conversation uh, about our appreciation of poetry our life history and we found out at least i found out that we had a, a lot in common in the, in the lives that we lived and uh, this brought us to a kind of uh, i think mutual understanding and mutual appreciation and he gifted me a number of his books and i devoured them and i loved them and they are some of my most prized books in my, in my collection, The pre embroidered Moment, Blue Chevy's, wonderful, wonderful. Um, but I'm going to read one of my own poems. Uh, it's titled, As a Blind Man Travels. The Western Wall is notes perfumed with a love 2,000 years wide. I accidentally brush hands pressed with sweat and hope. 
The bazaar of Marrakesh is leather and sour sumac. The vendor's ululations are my call to morning prayer. Though I haggle with no one, I am never alone. As I'm carried away in a whoosh of motors, the streets of Trastevere hold me tight and smell of tripe. <laughs> a laundress with the voice of a toad barks Romanesco at a man from Bangladesh who hawks roses. They are both Rome to me. I can feel the cobblestone sinking and hear the lagoon erode the gondolas, but my beagling salsa whisper and reassurance, there will always be a Venice in my memories. The prog clock of the old town square sounds like the face of a friend as it rings out the places of the stars. The underground trains speed towards prosperity. The intercom voices are a confident polka. The salesmen of Soviet berets sing dirges. Their nostalgia is their currency and their deceit. Prague is the city of the future, of the past. Cities without sight are Luna Parks for the mind. Thank you. <laughs>
that I didn't get a chance to read before. So, uh, it's titled We Never Have Time to Talk. And it starts with an epigraph from a famous Romanian poem, poet, Nikita Stănescu. Let's chat, let's talk, let's say words. Hmm. We never have time to talk about the taste of tomatoes and plums. While I'm there, we never have enough time, so I chat with mom when I'm back in New Jersey, in my room unpacking. I tell her about the shoes I got, beautiful, but they break my feet, and I know she can hear me. She answers me with a story I know well about the new bright shoe size five she wore to work one day and all her colleagues who wanted to try them like Cinderella's stepsisters, contorted feet, toes squeezed <coughs> tight, finally busting out of the delicate pumps. We never have time to talk about these things, but when we're apart, or when we dream, walking together in skewed gardens where words hang from the trees like fat plums, sweet, juicy words we eat, we swallow whole. We never have time to talk, but when we're dead, oh, the long conversations will unwind, <laughs> the puns, the laughter, the wisecracks of our blabbering bones chatting in the ground. You bet. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Yeah, <laughs> she does. She does. She was given that knife by Jim, and she uses it. Natalie, would you come up and read us a poem? Yeah. Natalie Rogers with a D. Yeah. Oh, no, you can do better. Yeah. Natalie Rogers with a D. Yeah. Really? tonight was so beautiful. You know, I'm like sort of out, outside watching. I didn't know Jim, but it was so loving and, and a community, a community, a loving community. Every single person here in a different way loved Jim and knew him in a different way. Mm -hmm. And just a beautiful experience. <laughs> I don't know anything like that, really. Um, my, my story with poetry has been very uh, different. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'd like to, this is a book that was written by um, Evie Ivey. I don't know if you know her, yes. oh, but I she's a yeah. wonderful, wonderful poet and presence in the world of poetry in New York City. And she put together this um, anthology. COVID, uh, anthology, and I had the privilege of being included in the book. And, uh, okay. One year of silence. Living the same day over and over, days of silence. Wrapped in puffs of weighted air, stillness, inhospitable and cool, gives no invitation for examination, not one word of why. I thirst for a single drop of sound, even a bare sigh. Only quiet greets me. Quiet, stuffed in my mouth, my throat, my ears, choking the sanity out of me, I attempt a strategy of survival. Cheerfully, I think, what sounds will tomorrow bring? What yesterday sounds can I recall? And I remember loud happiness, 
laughter bouncing against the walls, the whoop and holler of past exultations, the sudden memory brings comfort. Or was it a dream? A dream? Has it come to this? Do I doubt the sounds of my past? Do I dare to question how my lips trembled as I spoke my vows? Are memories fading? What, what, what is happening to me? Let me save myself with one hopeful thought, a thought to be my mantra till sound returns. What then is this silence, if not some beautiful sound waiting to be born? Thank you, Natalie. Next up, Della Rowland. Della, come and read us the poem. Good night, Mark. By the way, we have more copies of Red Wheelbarrow 16 if someone doesn't have one. Here, for sale. It's a little slip of a thing I wrote uh, for my grandson when he was about three and he was uh, having a sleepover and he couldn't sleep. <laughs> and you'll be able to tell what he was into. <laughs> when we are sharks, for Benny Boy, when we are sharks that couldn't sleep, we make us up some dreams of sharks that couldn't sleep, <laughs> that swam to breathe so wouldn't sleep. Then quick as a fin, we're sound asleep, and dream we're sharks that dream they swim all day and sleep all night in the bottom of the bed, in the ocean of the bed, where currents go to breed. Mm. Excellent quality poetry, excellent quality. Is there an SJ here? This, this should go by SJ, SJ! Here. Please notice the skull and crossbones on his shirt and be careful what you consume. Um, first of all, I just, this is so wonderful to be a part of this thing tonight. It's just, it's just a lovely thing. But uh, there's one thing you need to know about me if I needed to play a game of uh, uh, two truths to the lie. It is that um, imposter syndrome is real. Imposter syndrome is real. Imposter syndrome is real. Um, and uh, this is my, uh, to lay up in the evening, this is my uh, poem, Future Eulogy. We are gathered here today to honor my mother. Oh boy. You lie before me still and hopefully at peace. My tongue is sour and my words have dried up. And now I must carry the guilt and missed opportunities. We've never seen eye to eye, but I loved you. I fought for your attention, your admiration, trying to be something I never was for your benefit and my detriment. This is not your fault. We cultivated this garden of regret separately, meticulously strangling the beauty we didn't want to see in each other, replacing it with weeds sapping each other's strength so we couldn't stand like the trees, uprooting roots needed for connection. And now there's nothing left except me. And I continue our war on my own, not knowing how to end it or why it started. Perhaps one day I will be where you are, oblivious to the future eulogy before me, handing over our failure to the next generation, our greatest family heirloom, in hopes they will get it right. Here, Mom, let's go home. And that is the irony of it all. We are both here now. We don't have to be on this path. Yet here we are, walking towards oblivion, together at last. Thank you.
Joel is a really great poet, so it's a little sad. Joel, you gonna read for us? Yes, I am. Oh, he's right. here! I thought you'd love to get your uh, thing. Oh, this is I'm hitting the road. Oh, well, come up and read us a poem. Oh, great. Joel is a fantastic poet. <laughs> poet of science. Poem. It's from a very narrow genre. It's called the retirement poem. <laughs> um, I retired uh, from the DA's office in Staten Island after 22 years, and I told my supervisor I'm retiring, and she said, "Well, we're going to have a retirement party for you." Mm. I said, "No," <laughs> I says, "I don't want to have a retirement party." And I said, "The only way we can have a retirement party." is that you serve White Castle hamburgers <laughs> and you get to read poetry. Figured that would put her off. <laughs> she said, okay. <laughs> and, and, and being, I worked, I'm a victim advocate. I was like the only man, it was all my female colleagues and the only women I know who like White Castle hamburgers also like to participate in amateur roller derby. <laughs> so this is and a uh, Windsor knot. People know what Windsor knot is? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so named after the book of Windsor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the few reasons I like going to work was I could wear I like wearing ties. Mm -hmm. Now I don't bother changing my clothes now that I'm retired, you know. <laughs> a Windsor knot. First the sound of work boots clumping up our Rutherford Hayes era stairs. Then the crisp rap on the door. It's Mark, the direct laundry guy, returning my dry cleaning swaddled in plastic. Once inside my nerd cave, I proceed to unwrap my office wear, finding an alien necktie between a brace of my Tourette's shirts. I check the label on the mob pattern tie, and it reads Hermes. Mm. I tell my wife, mm. hey look, direct laundry put an Hermes tie in the delivery. Mm -hmm. Sandy, whose stepdad was in the schmata business, checks out the label. Yep, it's the real thing. <laughs> well, I got me a fancy French tie, I respond. Sandy, a feminist scholar, puts down her half of the world to admonish. That might be some hedge fund guy's favorite tie. Mm -hmm. It might be a Father's Day gift from his kids. Mm. I consult the Pierre K. O. Vote, Ethics mm -hmm. of the Fathers, for guidance. None mm -hmm. found. The ancient sages of the Babylonian exile did not wear neckties or ascots to jazz up their dusty and probably itchy robes. So I take a Solomonic education, decided that I'll wear the tie to work tomorrow, then report the orphan necktie to Ali, direct laundry's owner. I pick, I pick out an egg blue shirt with amber cufflinks to bind the sleeves and get out to deal with my usual plate of misdemeanors, landlord tenant smackdowns, uncivil neighbors, porch pirates nickeling deliverables, grudge-driven tire slashers, texted threats, prophecies, and visions. Mm -hmm. At my desk, the gravitas induced by Aramis is slathered over me like a child spreading fluffernutter on his bologna sandwich. <laughs> I'm really doing a job one prefers to leave to one's stars. With the day's work done, ferry across an upper bay of tugs, lumbering cargo ships, and the calypso of a passing cruise ship headed toward the Narrows. Back in Hoboken, I call up direct laundry to report possession of his semi purloined time. <laughs> Ali breaks character, laughing, Don't worry, Lewis, we couldn't get the food stains out of your buffalo chicken wing pattern tie. So we pulled the tie out of the unclaimed stuff. Wear it in good health. I report back to Sandy regarding the voyage of the now devalued tie. Well, it goes to show you, Joel, life is not a plot, but a stutter of digressions. <laughs> as I place the Hermes cravat behind a radish pattern tie, exclaiming, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for staying, Joel. Thank you so much for staying. And I'm sorry I didn't move you up higher on the list. I should have just given you a five or something. You should have given me a little something. Thank you for finally realizing what the true deal is. And you knew about it and you didn't do it. Robert Mendes would.
I have a little gold bar. Yeah. <laughs> David? Okay. Thank you so much, Joel. Okay. Bye, Joel. Uh, Bye. Good train ride. David Folds, you here? Well, then come up and be here. taste of time. Do I consume it or does it eat me? The rush for higher conscience may seek to have an answer at the last gate's moment, attaining a finish, embracing, enveloping eternity. But will fate take your time? Will your time tick off each second towards a tape broken with finality? Or will moments accumulate a symphony? adding more and more strings, swarming into a sound that radiates into every corner? Or will your growth more quietly build, stepping softly towards each experience? Your journey, your hills and valleys form the reply, walk on, continue, even when you sit in silence. For time, every moment is a piece of the puzzle of eternity. Yeah. Gordon, Gordon Gilbert, come up here and read us a poem. mistakes again. On the way up, making mistakes was the norm. Falling over, falling down, how we learned in increments to stay upright, to take a step, to walk, and then to run, to dance, to leap and land. And then for a while we were at the top of our game, confident, and full of grace. We dared and we succeeded, taking for our starting line the best from those who came before, pushing the envelope, striving to do more, do better, sometimes succeeding. But now I'm making mistakes again, but of another kind, the kind that's caused by forgetfulness ineptitude, the kind made in decline. Hmm. Perhaps mistakes like these are what bother me the most about growing old. Wow. Thank you. Greg, who I do not know, Greg Rapel. Greg! Greg, new guy! New guy! Not new! Greg? Prayer. I don't mind your global warning. Burning ash and Christmas trees, torching kids, Hawaii warming. I'll be next, there is no doubt, as overthirst is not spared drought. 
But as long as you will spare the kittens, then I'll find excuse to cope. Responsive when respect is real, receptive fur, a loving bundle, while alive, alive to hope. Once cats are sure, their purrs is truly from you two. Truest love's unending offer. So kill me, God, before I know the feline you allow to suffer. Vision. Thank you so much, Craig. Michael Manzik. All right. Truck of Ducks. <laughs> Water. Hey everybody! Uh, hello again. Hello again. I get to do double. Get to do two today. Um, mm -hmm. Double duty. This is. Uh, there, there used to be a town in New Jersey called West Patterson. Mm -hmm. We remember that, right? Once mm -hmm. upon a time. Yeah. And there used to be a couple of bars in that town that you could go and hear jazz late at night. Mm -hmm. One was Gulliver's down on Bright Avenue. And the other one was called Three Sisters. Nice little dive. They had a little pool table on the side that used to. Sink in the middle. Mm. Couldn't, couldn't get a straight shot. Of it. <laughs> but the music, the music was wonderful. This is Sunday night at the Three Sisters. I think it's 1977, if I remember. Mm -hmm. Jackie Black Beret peeled avocado doldrums away like matchsticks put behind barroom eyes. He lived in the Wolf Gate for years, so named by its cause for construction. To admit no wolves, nor the fears of same, whose effect directed the gate. A few amorous camels managed to cross its threshold, when with a lilting Turkish drawl began to woo the ears of those who would listen. Their speeches of unstopped passion melted the muffs on the ears of some chilled indwellers, their eyes desirous with the color of Polish gherkins. When the words of those multi-humped flatfoots finally sang true inside, the noise of joy could not be contained. Out of it came creaking, squeaking, speaking in fits of exasperated energies until the exhilaration flooded all boxes of speech apples. Vocal admiration was all the warmth could, mentor, could muster, so the camels cooled their hot dogging and told them of their travels. This temperate region, with all its deciduous imbecility, <laughs> was a night out for that, cavern, for that caravan, and a bad one at that. Well, true, it was necessary that they pause to recount their escapades. This momentary evanescence of total recall prevented them from processing a new adventure. But after closing time, it wasn't too late to hunt for a light, to jump on a tune of the living and swing it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's so great to have you back as a regular, Mike. Joe Giacovino, did you stay? Joe, I, oh, Joe Giacovino was here. I wish we could have heard him. He's not here now anymore. Um, so, I think you're going to read a poem? I'll read a poem before you read a poem. <laughs> I know it is. It was up to you before. This is called, this is called Letter to My Wife. You guys okay over there? Yes, sir. <laughs> Letter to My Wife. How tired you must be to all have me always asking if you love me, how much, how brightly, and whether I am handsome. Now, with you away, and me alone beneath these fallen leaves, I ask the squirrels digging near my head if you love me. I ask the starving deer exuding pellet poo while grazing on the bleeding hearts to whisper me how much. And of the red-tailed hawk who lands close by to disembowel the rabbit she has caught and stands there with her talons on its neck, I ask if that pure light we lit persists. But only you can tell me if I'm handsome. <laughs> and now, thank you. And now to close out the evening that he opens so brightly, I bring you Don Zerilli. I have not shown this poem to Jim Klein. 
<laughs> and I dodged the bullet tonight as well. <laughs> this is called The Best and Worst Poem. An old man reads me his poem. The lines short, the way an old man becomes short. The best and worst poem I have ever heard. Not a poem. A losing hand of groans. A way <laughs> to leave the table where the rest of us are trapped. The man reads his poem to me from a book, but privately. A secret not revealed but made of something I once knew. His left hand can't buckle a seatbelt, which makes him laugh the same way he laughed at how great his poem was. Absurdly great, impossible to latch. Baker's chocolate, a zinnia grown to human height who in the rain softened ground collapses. An old man writes a poem, navigating literature to a diner with fancy water glasses, refining the amateur, dying in sections like an origami of patient devastation. At the register, the line grows shorter. Dessert, dinner, and breakfast on the same table. A muse sits between us. <laughs> Separate checks. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. And let me invite you, before we leave, to come back next month on March the 6th for our next reading featuring Judith Christian. Oh, she's good, yeah. Thank you all for coming again. It was a really fabulous evening. <laughs> See you soon.